Hi, my name is Lauren Layfield and this is your next podcast. The podcast which creates a brilliant list of shows for you to try, adding a new one every week. So whenever I hear in the news that like a big celebrity has had a stalker, it always really spooks me out. It's something that Sandra Bullock has gone through. I think Taylor Swift recently has had some issues with people turning up on her doorstep. It's very scary. So when I first heard about this podcast, my ears really pricked up. Anatomy of a Stalker looks at all aspects of this really horrible crime and the different motivations which might lie behind someone committing it. It's really informative and completely, if slightly disturbingly, fascinating. Before we begin, I just want to warn you that this episode contains discussion about stalking and sexual assault, which some of you might find upsetting. Please listen with caution. Erotomanic delusional disorder, which is really a delusion of, of love, so that person I was feels scared that they are to put my child's nappy in bin because I knew he would be watching me at some point, and I didn't know what he was doing. One summer's night, she fell asleep and she woke up, and this man was stood at the foot of her bed. And there's no doubt in the mind that, given a opportunity, this man will kill you. There was nothing that I could do. Stalker. When you hear that word, what image comes to your mind? Is it a hooded figure walking down the street? Someone hunched over their computer screen? Can you see them? Do they look familiar? My name is Rachira Sharma and I'm a journalist based in the UK. For the past few years, I've written about the rise of stalking, from the worst cyberstalker in UK history, Matthew Hardy, to stalkers taking advantage of COVID lockdowns to terrorise their victims. I've always gravitated towards stories that hold up a mirror to the darkest parts of our society. But this feels different. Four years ago, a close friend of mine became a victim of stalking after an ex-partner refused to accept their breakup. He extended the grip on her life, incessantly messaging people she knew without her knowledge and threatening to turn up at her house. It very nearly ruined her life. Over the years, I've come to realise just how prevalent stalking has become alongside the rise of the internet. And with that, just how ill-equipped we are to stop it. I've spoken to influencers and OnlyFans creators who were shamed for having large online platforms when they spoke out about their stalkers. But throughout this time, I've been plagued with the same unanswered questions. What drives people to do these things? And can they ever change? In this podcast series, I'm embarking on a journey to peel the mask from the boogeyman. I'll speak to experts who come across stalkers daily, from prosecution barristers to forensic psychologists and to a survivor who's come out the other side. Just what is the anatomy of a stalker? When I think of stalking, I imagine someone obsessed, someone that can't help but compulsively check up on their victim wants to hurt their victim, consume them. But what does the public think of stalkers? So I'm about to head out and ask people some questions about stalking. I'm not really sure what I'm going to get, but I'm interested to hear what everyone thinks. The first question that I'm going to ask is the image of a stalker, if anyone has a particular idea or stereotype or cliche of what a stalker looks like. Stalker? Yeah. I don't know. Shady person, like literally a little silhouette behind me, I don't know. It's always a guy that comes to mind, Yeah, actually. yeah, to be fair, yeah. it's the same with me. To be honest, I would think instinctively of a man. I would think of a guy who is very obsessive, um, usually directing that obsession at a woman. Um, I would think of a stalker as, as someone like antisocial, maybe a loner, someone who kind of can't deal with rejection maybe. 
Most likely a white middle-aged man. You're not the first person who said that actually, yeah. Why is there any reason why that comes up, do you think? Um, that's how it's shown on the media. I definitely think of like a parody version of a stalker. Like it's definitely a man. He's maybe wearing a trench coat. He's sort of walking around maybe with a big newspaper and some fake glasses on. Like he's weirdly not as sinister as I know in my head what a stalker can be. So I see it's almost the same thing as seeing like thinking as of a robber wearing a black and white stripy t-shirt like i'm seeing the kind of cartoonish version of a stalker rather than like the actual sinister thing one in five women and one in 12 men will be stalked during their lifetime For something so common, it feels like there is so much misunderstanding around what stalking actually is. Most of the people I've spoken with on the street admit they have a stereotype of a stalker. And maybe I do too. So what's the reality? Stalking involves a targeted pattern of behaviour in which the perpetrator intrudes on the victim's life where they're not wanted and have no right to be causing distress and or fear. Dr Rachel Wheatley is a forensic psychologist working in independent practice and the practitioner programme director at the University of Derby. So to break that down, it's very targeted, it's very fixated on a particular person. It's a pattern, so it's two or more contacts, two or more acts of behaviour. There's a context to this, there is a, there's a repeated element to it. It's very obsessional, so it takes up a lot of that person's thinking time, um, as well as their emotions, as well as some of the acts and behaviours that they carry out. Um, in terms of driving to a location, going to buy a gift, writing out a lengthy email, sending lots of texts, sending lots of voicemail messages, etc. Also, there's the element of it being unwanted. So uh, intruding on the victim's life. So it's very one way where they're not wanted and have absolutely no right to be. And that also causes them distress or fear. You know, stalking isn't a mental illness. A lot of times I think the stereotypes, particularly in the research that I've undertaken myself with people convicted of stalking and also in my client work, is that people that have engaged in those behaviours really do distance themselves from the stereotype. And the stereotype being this is that people think that if you are, if you stalk somebody, there is something wrong with you. there is something about your mental well-being, social skills or your um, weird or some kind of, you know, lurking stranger that's, that's hidden away from everybody. Obviously, occasions where people will stalk and a lot of those things are at play. So, for example, people will stalk and they might use following behaviors. You know, people might have mental health and well-being issues. But stalking is a pattern of behaviours, it's a course of conduct and people that commit stalking offences are so varied in terms of their motivations, things that are underpinning uh, and contributing to why they are stalking. So that might be lack of social skills, it might be their rejection sensitivity, it might be a whole host of different things. And so it's very difficult to define Um, a person that stalks as one particular thing. What do you mean by problem behaviour? So what we're doing actually is saying that, you know, by saying stalking is a problem behaviour, you know, we're saying it's not a mental illness. It's usually a pattern of behaviours that occur after a situation or event and because of personal thoughts and feelings that bring about some kind of difficulty that that person has in, in managing that particular situation. So it might be because of their loneliness. It might be because they long for a relationship with a particular someone and have been ruminating or obsessing, got this restricted interest around this particular person. It might be because they feel they have a grievance against a particular person. It might be against an ex-partner. 
So again, when we think about the variety of people that, you know, that the person stalking is targeted against, um, we really do see that stalking is perpetrated against a whole host and range of people. It can be a complete stranger, although around 80%, potentially more of times, the victim will know who the person is that's stalking them. They might not know them very well, but they might know of them. So we... As I dig deeper in my research, I keep coming across stalker typologies. Developed by forensic psychologist Paul Mullen, it's essentially a method of breaking up stalkers into different types according to their motivations. So I think they're really useful uh, categorizations to help us as practitioners to, to really find some quick ways in or at least have, being mindful of all the different things here that might be at play that we might need to think about in terms of risk management, treatment intervention, or even just understanding why is that person doing what they're doing at this point in their lives. So the rejected stalking arises in the context of the breakdown of a close relationship, usually former sexual intimate partners, could be family members, close friends, uh, etc. But it's normally the ex-intimate partner. The initial motivation for the stalking is uh, either attempting to reconcile the relationship or to uh, exact some kind of revenge for that perceived or actual rejection. And actually what we see in practice is a bit of an oscillation between the two. You know, you'll see people really trying to claw back that relationship and then the next minute being very sort of angered and, and threatening. And again, you know, you can... You can hear through behaviours and, you know, messages. You can sort of see the whole sort of thinking patterns and, and the emotion behind the stalking that's occurring. The intimacy seeker is really the uh, uh, category of people that stalk, which arises out of a context of loneliness and, you know, a lack of a real close confidant and somebody, you know, it's like a, a, a real aloneness, you know, and that yearning for some kind of real connection to, to somebody. Um, the victims are usually strangers or acquaintances and, uh, you know, the, the desire really is for a relationship. Oftentimes the behaviour is fueled by some kind of serious mental illness, for example, delusional beliefs about the victims that they're already in a relationship or have had a close relationship or a relationship is about to ensue. Oh my God, say yes, hi. I'm Chad Michael Busto, you know who I am. I need to see you at some point while I'm here in New York. Okay. What you're hearing in this clip is the actress Drew Barrymore being rushed off stage after an alleged stalker approached her at an event in 2023. I don't have the authority to state which typology of stalking this incident falls under. But when Dr. Rachel talks about delusional beliefs, I can't help but think of the stereotypical celebrity stalker the quote-unquote crazed fan whose obsession becomes completely fantastical. Court ordered Busto to stay away from Barrymore. I'm actually hoping that uh, we can maybe repair our relationship uh, if that needs it. But yeah, for the duration of the case, I'm going to have to um, have a stay away order. You know, there's some real, quite strong uh, delusional beliefs behind somebody that's stalking of that category. So already you can see between the two typologies that I've talked about, Although stalking behaviours is a course of conduct not defined by any particular act, the contacts, the unwanted contacts, might be very similar. But with the intimacy seeker, what's driving it is, you know, this, uh, this thought process that's not based in reality at all. But the, the overall goal is, I don't want to be lonely, I want to be connected to someone, I want a re relationship, I want a healthy relationship, we're meant to be together. not based in reality. This image of stalking is the first thing that came to my boyfriend's head when I asked him about the subject. What do you think of a stalker? What kind of image comes up for you when I say that word? The crazy men who have stalked famous women celebrities. I feel like every woman has a, some kind of stalker, famous woman. The 
these labels were manufactured in 1999 so you know they they are very useful i i sometimes feel very uncomfortable using these particular terminologies but um you know they 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 are there to describe a particular big category of of people and and what seem to be the key issues so let's bear that in mind but i uh, just want to acknowledge you know that we we generally don't go around uh, you know talking to people and calling them uh, an incompetent suitor for example but the incompetent suitor generally stalks again in the context of loneliness or even lust and targets their attentions towards stranger acquaintances um, their initial motivation is not really uh, to establish a loving relationship so much, but really to sort of get a date or, you know, a short term sexual relationship, you know, or to strike up some kind of close friendship. Um, I would think of a stalker as, as someone like antisocial, maybe a loner, someone who kind of can't deal with rejection, maybe. They will usually stalk for quite brief periods of time. And I say usually because, again, there's always these caveats. There's always human beings are very diverse, which is great. <laughs> um, so when we try to categorise, there's always going to be, you know, people that don't fit the typologies. And, it, and it's not that the people are wrong or the typologies are wrong. You know, it's we've got to just keep that open mind all the time. So they will usually stalk for brief periods. Sometimes they have an insensitivity, um, I guess, to sort of uh, social cues or, or norms. They might have cognitive limitations, poor social skills, intellectual disability, you know, um, all sorts of things that would make them come across quite forthright, you know, quite clumsy or, you know, quite insensitive to other people's perspectives on the situation and whether they want a date or not. The actor Hugh Jackman was approached by a female stalker in 2013. Thurston followed, crying and screaming she loved him and wants to marry him. Then she pulled out an electric razor filled with hair, eventually throwing it at Jackman. He's a woman who obviously needs help, so I just hope she gets the help she needs. The resentful stalker typology is uh, where stalking arises when they feel as though that they've been mistreated or they've uh, you know they've been victimized in some way there's been an injustice or a humiliation victims again usually strangers or acquaintances who are seen to have mistreated that person it can arise out of uh, some kind of serious mental illness again so that person might be quite paranoid at times and uses stalking as a way of getting back at the victim so the person that they perceive has been um, targeting them. Um, the initial motivation is really about revenge or to sort of even the score or to give themselves a voice because of this real oppression that they've been uh, suffering. So it's a, it's a fight back, you know, and uh, people that I've worked with from this particular category um, oftentimes you see lots of bullying in their own history, you know, where they've been a victim of abuse and, and bullying at school. And, you know, so uh, oftentimes I've seen with the people that I've worked with that, you know, it's these these beliefs haven't just come out of nowhere. You know, they, they've got some kind of memory pattern matching from their past. You know, their brain's probably doing the thing that it should be doing, you know, is is being kind of hypersensitive for these tricky psychological moments that cause them real harm and distress. Predatory stalker typology arises in the context of deviant sexual practices. So a deviant sexual needs, like an itch that needs to be scratched. It can kind of snowball really quickly or it can be a bit of a slow burn in terms of developing a sexual interest towards somebody, usually a female stranger um, by a male. It can involve quite a bit of uh, voyeurism, monitoring, surveilling, watching, planning an attack, you know, really getting to know the intricate details and routine of a somebody and getting gratification and sort of sexual gratification out of, you know, information being power, you know, knowledge is power and planning that uh, that attack. So, uh, and then, you know, if, if an attack does occur on the back of that, um, it can usually be, um, you, you know, a rape, attempted murder or a sexual, a sexual murder. It may not come as a surprise that a crime like stalking has a high reoffending rate. The Susie Lamplow Trust, 
estimates that 55% of convicted stalkers go on to reoffend. What is it about stalking that might explain its high reoffending rate? Does it say something about the crime or the profile of people doing it? You can't really have one without the other, if that makes sense. So there is no one profile of people that stalk. Obviously, we've talked about the different typologies, and hopefully that gave you a bit of an overview of the sort of variants in terms of uh, risks, motivations, and potentially their own particular needs and well-being needs. Stalking is a, a crime of pattern. So, you know, there's a course of, of conduct. So by that very nature, there's a repeatedness about it. Um, the high reoffending rates that you refer to may well be the fact that somebody's stalking behaviour has already begun its course. Obviously, the longer that it uh, continues for, it becomes to take over that person's life. It becomes an investment, um, harder to move back from as well, and harder to move out of that train of thought. So um, I know particularly in terms of the research that I did with people convicted of stalking and uh, people that I work with generally who have stalked people, often talk about this fact that once you get sort of caught up in this bubble, it, you know, the, the stalking and the motivation and the target and everything becomes their main focus. Everything else, like the whole balance that we might feel that we have in our own lives kind of just falls to the wayside. So it kind of takes over. There's this real snowball effect around stalking and that pattern and people getting really caught up in that. Hence why early interventions may hold the key to nipping things in the bud early on, you know, that circuit breaker um, idea. But yeah, absolutely. People did talk about the fact that once they were in it, it was hard for them to see objectively uh, what was going on and the impact of everything and the consequences for themselves and other people, you know, and recognising it was doing them more harm than good, even though at the time they were telling themselves, you know, or acting out on uh, urges, thoughts and, and feelings. They could see in hindsight that actually it took over their, their whole life and, and didn't actually get them anywhere. I think, again, you know, when you think about stalking might be to address somebody's uh, needs, wants and desires around connectedness to people, wanting a relationship, wanting to support their own sense of uh, self-worth, um, you know, that sort of sense of validation from having somebody that's uh, close to you and in your lives might have something uh, to do with it as well. Stalker. 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 I do always try, try, try really hard to avoid that word stalker. Um, I always try to separate stalking or the person that has been stalking or the person stalking. Uh, again, putting the person first and the behaviour uh, second. But actually, stalker is very different. Stalker doesn't talk to behaviours. Stalker is a label of a person. And actually, when you speak to most people, you say, well, define what a stalker is then. You know, people will either say one of two things, usually in my experience is, um, oh, you know, it's somebody that's like watching you and, you know, somebody that's like a complete weirdo that they're, you know, doing this, that and the other and following you and, you know, say some really horrible things about uh, people when you mention that word stalker. Or people use it in very, like, so-called funny, humorous ways and, you know, Valentine's cards with from your favourite stalker, you know. People wouldn't say, you know, send a... A Valentine's card going, oh wow, you're so sexy, uh, love you so much from your favourite rapist. You know, it's it's crazy actually when you think about how we use that term, you know, all the time. People saying, oh, I've been stalking you on Facebook. No, you haven't. You've just been looking at where they've been on holiday last because it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, whatever. So in society, there's this, this real dichotomy of how we perceive what a stalker is and so already when you look at the typologies and the situations and the characteristics that I've talked of there's such diversity such diversity um so yeah I, I don't like the label stalker I'm not afraid of ever calling out stalking 
So call it stalking is, is one of my taglines. It's, you know, it is what it is, course of conduct to or more unwanted contacts that could cause fear or distress. Um, anyway, I digress. I think we can all relate to those feelings of despair and loneliness when a relationship ends. Rejection isn't something we enjoy. To not even have had a relationship in the first place must be even harder. But rejection and breakups are experiences that we all go through. I've gone through it. I'm sure you have too. And whilst my friend tried to move on, her ex did not want to accept the ending of their relationship. So what makes someone flip the switch and descend into stalking? I know it may seem impossible, but I need to speak to someone who's actually done this. To hear from them why things got as bad as they did. I need to meet a stalker for myself. Thanks for listening to Anatomy of a Stalker. If you have been affected by any of the issues in this episode, resources are available on the advice and support page at crimeandinvestigation.co.uk forward slash advice. Next time, I begin my hunt for a stalker and speak to somebody whose stalker rang them 600 times in two hours. That police officer's partner drove to my house that night after her shift to warn me that this man will kill me. Anatomy of a Stalker is a crime and investigation original podcast from Q Podcasts. It's hosted by me, Rachira Sharma, produced by Kim Montgomery and Graham Woodcock, with music and sound design by Tom Hughes and Graham Woodcock. Niall Kalini Taylor is our executive producer, and the commissioning editors for Crime and Investigation are Sam Pearson and Diana Carter. So there's six parts to listen to and they cover everything. Psychology, law, and they speak to survivors as well. It's gripping stuff. All the episodes are available now wherever you're listening to this. Once you've tapped follow for Anatomy of a Stalker, don't forget to do the same for this show do so you can find your next podcast. All my recommendations from the whole series will also be on Podcast Rex at www.podcastrex.com. That is www.podcastrexrex.com.